Hey guys, it's Holly. And welcome to I Can't Like Things in a Cool Chill Way. So now this is gonna end up being like an hour long video essay about Daisy Jones and the six. We're talking about the book, the adaptation and everything in between. But like I say, this is gonna be a long one. So go grab a cup of tea. This is, I believe a peach and orange tea in my lovely new mug I bought from Tesco the other day. So like I say, pause, go grab a cup of tea, a cup of coffee. If it's the evening, grab a glass of wine, a tequila shot, I'm not here to judge, but we are going to get into Daisy Jones and the Six. Honestly, a tequila shot might be more in theme. Essentially what this video is, is it's a video essay about a book and an adaptation because I'm a second year English literature student and I have to put my skills to work somehow. So this is what has happened. Enjoy it, love it, like, comment, subscribe, click the notification bell. You know this, we're doing it at the start of the video today. Now I do have a little bit of housekeeping before we start this video. Firstly, this video will contain spoilers both for Daisy Jones and the Six, the book by Taylor Jenkins Reid and the adaptation on Amazon. So if you have not read the book or watch the adaptation, please leave now. This is your warning. I will give you a second. If you have stayed, I do not take any responsibility for any spoilers you may encounter. I have warned you. So secondly, this video will contain some content that I want to give some warnings about. So there will be references to addiction, substance use and misuse. There will also be reference to sexual assault and harassment, as well as abortion. So if any of those topics are something that feels like it may be triggering to you, or just something you aren't in the frame of mind to hear me talk about right now, thank you for watching this far. I appreciate your support, but look after you, put you first and click away. I'm sure I can catch you in another video soon soon and thirdly any photographs quotes or references to the book Daisy Jones and the Six or the adaptation Daisy Jones and the Six are purely for entertainment purposes under copyright law this is fair use for comment critique and reviewing purposes so please do not come for me now that we've got all that out the way let's actually get into the content of the video for anyone who may need a refresher Daisy Jones and the Six is about a fictional rock band Daisy Jones and the Six from the 70s. It's about their rise to fame, more importantly their downfall. It's messy, it's complicated, it's filled with brilliant tension and it is my favourite Taylor Jenkins read book that I have read. And the book itself is told as a bit of a transcript to an oral history. So much of what is said in here is all dialogue. It's a lot of telling rather than showing through the nature of the medium through which it is written. I want to talk a bit about the inspiration behind Daisy Jones and the Six. So obviously this is a fictional band from the 70s but there was a very big rock band and just band presence in the 60s, 70s, 80s kind of time so it makes sense for the author Taylor Jenkins Reid to have pulled from those eras for inspiration. In an interview on Penguin UK's YouTube channel with Taylor Jenkins Reid which I will put the link to down in the description as well as any other sources that I have used for this video. The author talks about how Stevie Nicks and Lindsay Buckingham's turbulent relationship as well as a lot of the drama surrounding Fleetwood Mac as they wrote the album Rumours, how that influenced and inspired both the tension and conflicts in Daisy Jones and the Six as a band, as well as specifically between Daisy and Billy in their relationship. But alongside that, a lot of the inspiration for these characters and this world have come from musicians autobiographies and memoirs. So that's from artists such as Bruce Springsteen, Joni Mitchell, Carole King and of course Fleetwood Mac. Interestingly, you do hear some of the music from those artists throughout the TV adaptation in the background. Specifically, I remember the use of Gold Dust Woman while Daisy is yelling at Nikki to leave and while she ends their relationship. And apparently that was also the inspiration behind the outfit she wears in their final performance, which are all great little details that I just love. But alongside that, there was an interview on Kelly Clarkson's talk show with Cami Marone, Suki Waterhouse and Riley K.O., our main trio playing Cami, Karen and Daisy, who were talking about how much of that music from that time period inspired them and Cami was talking about how she made a kind of inspirational 
playlist to help her get into character and a lot of those songs actually ended up in the show which I think is a really interesting touch. The adaptation itself was announced on July 25th 2019 which is the same year that the book was published. It was published earlier that year in March. The adaptation to the limited series of Daisy Jones and the Six is done by Amazon and Reese Witherspoon's production company Hello Sunshine Productions. The creators of the show are Scott Neustatter. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Scott Newstater and Michael H. Weber. If I pronounce any names wrong in this video, please forgive me, I'm trying my best. And alongside all of that, Taylor Jenkins Reid is a producer on the show. This was another show, as is the case with many at the moment, that production was postponed because of the lovely little pandemic we had going on. Do you remember her? She was great. But filming picked up in 2021 as part of the preparation period for the production. All of the cast went into band camp and they learned how to play the respective instruments, how to sing the songs, and it is them in fact playing. In terms of details, the first three episodes of Daisy Jones and the Six came onto Amazon Prime on Friday the 3rd of March 2023 this year and then every Friday in March there were subsequent episodes released until all 10 episodes are available. They are currently available. I did withhold from speaking on the adaptation until I had watched everything and done a reread of the book to get as fresh information for you guys as possible. But I like the approach they took. It was a different approach to what you see Netflix take a lot of the time where they drop a whole season in one day. I love a binge watch but I think with the tension in this series having to wait a week for more episodes was a really great touch to building that tension and alongside that they did release the album Aurora and all of the songs that are played by the cast in the TV series and I think that helped to tide people over because they still had that contact to the series versus now people aren't necessarily used to waiting for weekly episodes so I think if they didn't have that extra contact with the music you may have lost some viewers because of the waiting or people may have anyway waited till all episodes were out to binge watch. I watched them week by week and then waited till the end to watch them all again. But my favourite thing to talk about is about our characters, our plot, how those arcs have developed and how well they were developed. So we're going to get into that bit now. So first, I feel like we need to make some comments on the key differences in the adaptation compared to the book. For anybody who has read the book, I think the most glaring one is some of the timeline issues that were changed because so much happens in this book and there are so many scenes constantly back to back to back that there is so much content that can't be fit into 10 episodes. And I don't think you'd want this much content. I think it would bog down the TV series. I do think for writing for TV, it makes sense because you spend so much of this book getting to know Daisy Jones and then the six as separate entities. Whereas with a TV show, when you have something called Daisy Jones and the Six, if you spent half the series without them together, you would A, lose readers and B, you'd be limiting yourself so much to all of the key events that happen when they are together. I think it made sense to shorten the front end and have as much as possible of them together. And another thing I kind of touched on already is in the book, everything had to be said explicitly. How wild Daisy was, how badly Billy was crumbling, how explicit their feelings for each other were. It had to be said because of the structure of a transcript of an oral history. There was no way to convey things necessarily through unspoken looks or actions. They are being explicitly explained versus in a TV show, there are things that you can show to an audience without telling them they're there. That also saved some time in the TV show and also kept the audience engaged. How they wrote it works for a screen in a way that you'd think it would be really easy to put this on a screen but it would be if you were doing straight interviews and you aren't you're trying to create a linear storyline and i think they did it well so let's get on to some of our our band lineup changes if you will pete doesn't exist at all 
I don't know why Pete doesn't exist. And then also you have the Chuck situation of it all. He does leave, but he doesn't get drafted into the war. Instead, he goes to dentistry school and he actually shows up again later. He doesn't die. I don't really know why they felt the need to make that choice. It felt a little bit unnecessary, but go off, I guess. Something I did think they handled quite well was addressing the fact that they didn't have Pete and how it still made sense calling the band The Six, how they brought Camilla in earlier. She doesn't break up with Billy when he first goes out to California. She's with them through everything. She moves with them. She sticks with them before they have a record deal, whereas in the book, she agrees to come out and marry Billy because he has a record deal. She is there taking videos and photos, and I think her photography is much more of a key part of the TV adaptation. In a way, it alludes to how well she sees things that nobody else sees and how she's much more observant than everyone else around her. That really plays well to Cammy's character and she is this insightful, almost all-knowing figure compared to the others who never seem to really know what's going on and she's great for advice and always able to kind of get what she wants and read people really well so having her behind the camera almost is a physical representation of that alongside that she is part of the band she's been there through everything so it makes sense when they're naming the band and billy says the six of us are never going to be able to agree on the name it makes sense that cammy's included because she's always been included she's seen this band through everything they're her family graham's her little brother like karen's her her best friend in this really it's because of cammy that karen joined the band in the first place she is a key figure to it but also i think the loyalty created between Cammy and Billy and her believing in him moving to California before he has a record deal before there's any hope of him making it big it makes more sense that level of passion and devotion loyalty and hope for him and in him when it comes to how turbulent their actual relationship is with how quickly we get into Billy's infidelity and addiction if she had broken up with him and then come out to California it would really make people question why she stays with him versus we see her establish that she's loyal she sticks by them she's part of this and this is a life she's building for herself a couple of other character changes we have simone plays a larger role in this and we have her relationship with bernie both of which are changes i love i quite like that we establish an unconventional form of family for daisy as a sounding ground but she does have it which almost makes a stark contrast even more to what she didn't have from her parents it reminds us that she is lovable and she's young and she needs this protector which simone is for her so i love what they did with simone's character and i loved seeing more of her the creepy manager Daisy has in the book, Hank, he's not there, which we love that for her. So Rod is there for them as Daisy Jones and the Six's manager as soon as they go out on tour. It's said that it's like the hottest gig in town to be managing Daisy Jones and the Six. The next thing I really noticed was they made Daisy Jones essentially a nobody when she joined the Six for Look At Us Now slash Honeycomb. She hadn't released any music. She was working with Teddy, but she hadn't released any music. We've kind of seen glimpses that she can sing and Teddy seeing hope in her as a songwriter. In the book, she's already recorded an album and released an album the thing that fuels her about it is that it's not her songs they won't let her sing her songs and this is the thing with daisy singing has always come easy to her so she does not value her voice but she has to work for songwriting she has to work for her words to be heard and that's what she values not being able to record her own songs gives her that fire in her belly to really work to get better at songwriting and to work to have an album of completely something that is hers. You see that rhetoric kind of come up a little bit later in the TV series when they're talking about recording the Daisy Jones and the Six album and Billy says it's already all written and she says it should be as much hers as it is Billy's or Karen's or Graham's it's that need to be heard that we see but I think some of the establishment of that of being 
kind of pushed away as a songwriter in the industry, especially as a female songwriter in the industry. It's lost until a little bit later on why that motivates her so much, because we haven't seen her have that hardship of being rejected for her own album. Also new is this hinted at affair between Eddie and Camila. I know in the book, I believe she says she's having dinner with an old high school friend and you kind of maybe get the inclination that something might be going on, but it's never explicitly said. Versus they show her seeing Eddie at the bar and then she comes home crying. And later on, whilst they're on tour, Camila and Eddie have an interaction on the balcony where she says they aren't ever going to talk about it. But there's this suggestion that something happened there. And then later, when Eddie says he's leaving the band and talking to Billy, and he kind of hints at it, and Billy punches Eddie after Camila's also said to him something along the lines that suggests they've both been unfaithful in some way. There's a bigger part of it suggesting that Camila may also be in the wrong in the relationship, in the TV adaptation, which again creates more of a foundation of understanding for the forgiveness and the rebuilding of their relationship that comes to be. Now we're getting into things that I didn't love. The Grease episode. Why was it a whole episode for one? That did not need to be an entire episode in Greece. It felt very slow, it felt like we broke a lot of the tension, it felt like putting filler in, to be quite frank, it can't have been more than a 20 page interaction in the book. But here it's a whole episode. Also the fact that Nikki becomes an Irish prince she meets in Greece in the TV adaptation compared to an Italian prince she meets in Thailand and they go back to his home country to get married. I don't know why they felt the need to create that change. But the whole episode, it felt slow, it felt drawn out, and it felt like we spent far too much time with Nikki. I don't like Nikki. This is a man that is clearly manipulative right? He isolates her from her family and friends. He turns around and says in the TV adaptation that Simone, her true family, is in love with her and creates this rift between them, which further isolates her only to him. He is essentially encouraging her not to go back to tour with the six, even though that is everything she has worked towards. That is everything she's ever wanted because it means she finally gets to be heard as a musician and appreciated as a musician. That is until he sees the Rolling Stone article and realises how big they are and I'm guessing realises how much money and drugs they'll have access to because then he's all for them going back which is him entirely just being a freeloader and thinking about what's best for him, not at all what is best for his wife at this point. He's a horrible character. I really hate him and when she threw that bust or vase or whatever it was in the hotel at him, I cheered. Interestingly, Teddy still has his heart attack but he doesn't die from it. In the book, Teddy's death is a catalyst for Billy's downfall and it means that his intentions of helping Daisy kind of get skewed into his own pain and he neglects to be that helping force for Daisy anymore, making her downfall ten times worse. In the show that doesn't happen, instead the downfall is shifted more into this Camila, Billy, Daisy relationship drama, which I'm sure for an audience, especially who haven't read the book, that is probably far easier to follow. But it also means that I think they have had to change Camila's character slightly from the book to make that make sense. But essentially this shift from Teddy's death who got Billy into rehab being the catalyst for his relapse and him therefore being selfish in his addiction and not being able to help Daisy. In shifting that into the Camilla, Daisy, Billy relationship drama instead, 
you lose some of the complexity of exploring the triggers of addiction. There's also the inclusion of the Pittsburgh stop on the tour, the home stop that lets us see Mrs. Dunn and the house that apparently Graham has bought for his mother and their families there at a family show, which makes Eddie even more indignant when Billy goes on stage to play the guitar when it's normally Eddie and Daisy for a song because it's a home show Eddie's grandmother was there, this was his moment to shine and Billy took it away from him. We get a lot of interesting layers when you include the Pittsburgh stop, especially when you consider this is where Camila and Billy first met, but this also seems to be where Billy and Daisy are growing closer. So we start to see some parallels between Daisy and Camilla, but also how they really differ. And that's really important for the ending of the show. We also have this brilliant moment of Karen being pregnant and Camila figuring it out and saying I'm sorry to her and taking her to get the abortion because although Camila finds so much personal fulfillment in being a mother, she's aware that is not the road that Karen wanted to take for her life and there's these amazing interactions between the women that we're going to explore a little bit further into the video. What it means to be a woman and the choices of being a woman and the acceptance of women making different choices to your own but knowing it's best for them even if it wouldn't be best for you. This conversation of the female relationships is amazing and like I said we will dive into that a little bit further down but it's one of my favourite things about the show and the book and just Taylor Jenkins Reid and how Taylor Jenkins Reid writes. Taylor Jenkins Reid has this amazing affinity to finding a really interesting concept but figuring out what is the, the conversation of women and women in relationship to each other within that setting. That's one of my favourite things about Taylor Jenkins Reid's writing. Also, let's just talk about the significance of the abortion in general. This is a woman in the 70s getting an abortion. Roe versus Wade was passed in 73 and Karen's getting an abortion in 1977. That is still considered this bold move, but she's doing it because she knows it's right for her and she's accepted in doing this by the women around her. And it's just it's so beautifully done and i think it's also arguably very important to see in a tv show currently with everything going on with american abortion law and the overturning of roe v wade the supreme court and the effects that's had on the states themselves but just in general in the world i think portraying this storyline of abortion not being condemned but being accepted as the right choice for this woman and for the life she wants to lead it's a very important story to tell and they did it beautifully i think now we come to the most glaring change and that is they had to choose a linear storyline for the relationship of Daisy and Billy. In the book, you're hearing these two talk one after another constantly. You could have discrepancies, you could put that unreliableness in there, the will they, won't they, did they, did they not, of having two very separate storylines. And if you were showing a linear story that's meant to be flashbacks or, or whatever, and constantly you had their interviews budding in going, actually it worked like this, actually it worked like that. That's fine one or two times. If that was every five minutes, every episode, you would get so exhausted. Audiences would feel a disconnect. It would bring them out of the story too much. So they had to choose a linear storyline. And every now and again, you could have interviews that created discrepancies and or you could see them tell other people in this storyline that something happened that it didn't or that something didn't happen when it did they had to make choices to make it make sense in the form in which they were telling it a classic example is in the book you don't actually know whether they kiss when daisy storms out of the studio you can read into it what you want but it's not explicitly said thus they explicitly create the kiss 
in the TV show, but it's said by then Billy later to be almost a manipulative thing to get her to the place to record the song in the way that she needs to record it, regret me, so... You still don't quite know whose story to trust on it, but you do get a definitive storyline. Talking of Daisy, literally named in the title, and I feel like I've not spoken yet of our lovely Daisy, one of the biggest criticisms I hear is that we did not get Wild Child Daisy. This is what I was talking about earlier in showing not telling. Wild Child Daisy is there, she's just not handed to you in explicit sentences. We see rather than being told that her drug and alcohol use is made casual because this is the 70s in the rock and roll world. There's drugs and there's alcohol flying around everywhere, but she just might be the person that wakes up, pops a pill, drinks a bottle of champagne and turns up to the studio with it still in her hand. It makes sense that nobody in the interviews are commenting on it early on because it's part of the world they live in. Now, if you watch, you see her do it more than other people. You see her carrying pills. You see that she's never not on something, but you have to be watching to see it. The first time I watched some of the episodes, I was writing essays at the same time at university and I wasn't explicitly watching it and I missed a lot of those details because I wasn't paying attention. On the rewatch, it made so much sense in how they portrayed her. Other things we get to see. We see her bum a cigarette off someone outside the whiskey and sneak in that way. We see people outside of clubs start to know who she is, bouncers letting her in without question, indicating that she's a very integral part of the scene, that she's there a lot. That's what she does from a very young age. We see her go into a room with an older musician and assumedly lose her virginity. And afterwards she says this amazing line, indicating how young she was when all this was happening and how young she got into this scene as that kind of young child, wild child figure, where she says, I wasn't naive, I was a baby. She was so young and nobody was there to protect her and she was so vulnerable. When you understand her vulnerability and how it was used against her and how people took advantage of her in those scenes when she was younger, how she grows to not wish to be vulnerable with anybody, you understand why because you've seen those things happen. And all those things that I've talked about, those were scenes in the books that were explicitly fed to us and they just became a montage instead. You still see all of those things just in a different format. All those things, they tell you why she is slightly hardened by this scene and why later in life she seems easygoing until you hit on something that matters. Similarly, you also get to see where her motivation from her relationship with her parents comes from. Arguably, you see a little bit more in the TV series because they can show it to you. From her mother's criticism that no one wants to hear her voice or when her mother reads her songbook and just calls her pretty instead of commenting on how the songs were, to her parents' general apathy towards her existence, their focus on throwing parties for their adult friends and living their own lives, they move away without telling her. In the book, they don't move away and they even have dinner with Nikki, they're still present. In the TV series, they are nowhere to be seen. They leave without even a thought of their daughter or letting her know. Her mother contacts her when she's big and famous just to have a go at her for saying that she's an orphan and saying she should be more thankful for this mother that abandoned her and didn't tell their daughter, their only daughter, that they were leaving. All of those things add up to tell you why she wants to be heard authentically, why she wants to be given credit for what she writes. That's her voice, that's something that's been stifled for so long and she's finally able to use it to have people care about her in a way her parents never have. It's also why she doesn't really care for anything that comes easy to her, like her looks, because those are the things that her parents saw she had to offer the world and didn't look beneath the surface to care about the things about her she cared about her ability to write music, her interest in the scene. None of that mattered to them because she was pretty and that was to her benefit. 
Something I will say we don't see in discussing Daisy's drug use and her downfall is the scene in the book where on a plane Karen's sitting across from Daisy and Daisy takes two pills, forgets and goes to take another two pills and Karen comments on it and Daisy says she doesn't need the pills, gives Karen her pill box and instantly panics that she has nothing because she relies on these pills but instead we do see when her and Billy are writing songs in Teddy's house, Billy asks her how many pills she takes a day and she said she could stop anytime she wants, she flushes the pills. In doing so, she doesn't panic and later you see her take a pill out of her pocket and take it in Teddy's house. She hasn't had an opportunity to get any more, she just had another stash. And that's also indicative of that mentality of substance use and abuse that you can start to see blossoming that she doesn't think it's a problem yet she keeps extra pills on her. It's just those little signs of this may not be a huge problem yet, but she will crash and burn eventually. The adaptation worked to establish the backstory of Daisy Jones and the six as quickly as possible to get them together as quickly as possible, yet you still have two full episodes of backstory. They don't get together in the same room until the third episode so you do see a lot of this backstory it just is more limited than the book i also think some of this criticism we see of daisy's character and her not being wild enough in the first few episodes is because that runs parallel to billy's original downfall that ends up with him in rehab with him you know slurring his words on stage missing the birth of his daughter he is having this spectacular substance use and abuse arc whilst Daisy seemingly is able to manage it to a certain extent at the time and they're both on the same train but at different speeds. That means that in comparison to Billy it is meant to look casual because at the time it's still believed by people around her to be casual use. That also means that we get this greater contrast later when Daisy's married to Nikki who is always bringing drugs around and almost encourages her to take them and keeps her up all night partying. And when she eventually ODs in that shower, we see how far she's come. She's always done drugs, but it's got so much worse. That's what we need to see. We need to see that progression throughout the series. And they did that really well for me. I also like that they got songwriters in to not necessarily write the music just to the lyrics like in the back of the book but to rewrite the songs themselves to make them really work for the TV show and the narrative that they'd carved out and they obviously had their music coordinator for the show which was Blake Mills but they also got loads of different songwriters in who have different credits from Phoebe Bridges to Marcus Mumford. There was so many names, I'm not going to try and name them all. And truly, I like the fact that it's Billy who finds Daisy OD'd in the shower. Nikki runs away, leaves her, doesn't call anyone, just like he does in the book. But Rod does call someone, Billy helps her. This suggestion that there are people in her life that care about her versus her husband who will leave her to die. And it's so expertly done that she can't remember what's happened and goes and asks Billy and is willing to be vulnerable with Billy. She finds out Nikki left her there and she throws him out and honestly might be my favourite scene because I hated Nikki but it adds this layer of trust between them, especially when they had a very icy relationship. Billy wanted to kick her out of the band and suddenly the tenderness is back between them. And we see where this connection, not just in the music comes, but them as people. And we see their parallels really laid out in front of us, which creates that amazing arc into those final episodes, that final episode where we see the the Daisy, Camila, Billy drama going on. It sets it up quite nicely. And I think in Billy offering to help Daisy, we see for the first time, at least I saw for the first time, Billy cares about Daisy in the same way that Daisy has shown she cares about Billy this whole time. And it's the first time I can truly see that he does 
care for her. He doesn't just desire her or lust over her like she is an object of an addiction. He connects to her in a way and she has a piece of his heart. And as you may have put together through my talking so far, I adored above all else our flawed and nuanced characters. So we're gonna dive into that now. They have created a masterclass in complex, nuanced characters who aren't necessarily all going to make the right choices, but who are likeable anyway. My favourite thing about the book is they aren't cut and dry, black or white, good or bad. They exist so much in this morally grey area because they are acting on selfishness and addiction and all of these things that fuel a pleasure centre in the brain. They aren't thinking of consequences, they're thinking of we are the moment and living in the moment. They aren't always making the right choices and all of them make different bad choices but they are human, they are amazingly human characters because they aren't just doing things for the hell of it, you can see where their motivation comes from. When it comes to Billy, there is a lot in the book and in the adaptation that mean there's the potential for us not to like him. He is depicted as this family man, loving husband, really devoted to his wife and then finds out she's pregnant goes on tour, cheats on her, falls into addiction, misses the birth of his child. One thing I think the book did amazing was this acknowledgement in hindsight that they didn't really know anything about addiction at the time, which gives the context that they may not have acted in the best way because they thought he was just having a good time they didn't necessarily realize that it was addiction and that also plays into this it's the rock and roll world there's you know sex drugs rock and roll alcohols everywhere how much of that is the lifestyle and how much of that is a problem and for billy it was a problem in the tv show specifically sam claflin does this it's it's amazing after he's found out he's going to be a dad and he asks Camilla to marry him and they get married in their backyard that very night he's calling his mother on the phone and he doesn't tell her about the baby and Graham says you didn't tell her she's going to be a grandmother and you see this moment of realization kind of set in that he's going to be a father We've seen his father wasn't there, he's confronted his father for being a bad father, his father doesn't care about him or Graham at all, so he has no idea of what a good father is. It's like the fear and the pressure is so clear on his face before he crosses over and pours himself a drink. In that sequence, without him saying a word, you start to realise he doesn't know how to be a father because he never had one. He is scared, he is so scared of not being a good father that this is his solution. He's going to escape that fear in alcohol. We see that come up. When Billy comes home from rehab, he's sitting with Camila and Julia and Camila tells him to pick up his daughter and he starts crying in this scene. He doesn't pick up Julia and she asks him what he's so afraid of and he says, and I'm going to read this quote directly, I think I'm afraid she's going to love me and I'm going to fuck it all up. Perfectly pieces together to the audience that his fears are so all-consuming and they aren't just, oh, I don't know if I'm doing this right. There is an innate level to his person that believes he is not a good person, not good enough, not physically able to be a good father, that he tried to escape that and have something else to blame for not being present. The view of himself as a father and him not being worthy of his family, it contextualizes his relationship with Daisy so well, but it also establishes them as two sides of the same coin. There's this amazing parallel when they're on the Pittsburgh stop of the tour and Camila is sitting with Daisy and Daisy's interacting with Julia and she's great with Julia. It's established in the book that she's also great with Julia. But in episode nine, Camila asks Daisy if she's ever thought about it, about having kids. 
and Daisy explains how she doesn't want to damage another child the way her parents damaged her, the way that she was an accident and inconvenience and then as she grew up to be beautiful that's the only thing her mother saw and she became competition camilla turns around and says to her don't count yourself out so early daisy i don't think it's because in that moment she thinks every woman would want to be a mother because we see in the interaction with karen and being apologetic that karen's pregnant helping her get the abortion camilla knows that children, although they're her choice, they are not every woman's choice and they are not the right choice for every woman. But I think instead she sees this parallel between Daisy and her husband and if Billy can clean himself up and be a fantastic father, Daisy can sort herself out and become an amazing mother too. Camila has that faith because if she doesn't have that faith for Daisy, why could she have that faith for Billy? It's another time when you realise Billy and Daisy are two people that suffer with the same thing. With that being said, I do think Billy appeared more as a family man in the book. He's portrayed more selfishly and more self-indulgent in the TV adaptation. Whilst he still fights for his family at the end, he relapses and loses his way and tries to self-destruct. Instead of when he puts down that drink and someone takes it away from him, previously in the book he's not relapsing full on after that he's drinking at the show he's doing drugs he has a vial of coke and does coke in front of daisy he is fully hitting the self-destruct button and having him not as devoted to his family not having the twins be existing in the tv adaptation makes sense when they plan that giant downfall that giant spiral into relapse for billy because it would alienate audiences if they'd seen him being this amazing doting father who got to redo all his mistakes, be there for the twins' birth, make amends in a way, and throw it all away, and pursue Daisy, and then go and beg for forgiveness. That would have been too stark of a contrast if he'd already been able to make amends for what had happened. Speaking of our Daisy, Camilla, Billy nightmare i'm really mad that they didn't include the scene in the hotel room with camilla and daisy and julia sleeping where camilla says to daisy to leave the band to get sober and to walk away instead we have this scene where daisy's at the piano in the hotel and camilla says I'm going to read this directly. You think you are these two lost souls just fumbling your way through the dark, but you deserve each other. In the book, Camilla is not only convicted in the scene that Billy won't leave her, she extends compassion in the scene to Daisy versus in the TV adaptation, she acts almost bitter and a lot harsher than we see Camilla in the book. In the book, she says, and I'm going to quote again, I care about you because when I see you, I see an incredible writer who suffers from the very thing that the man I love suffers from. The two of you think you're lost souls, but you're what everybody is looking for. It's not a bitter statement. It's one of those moments where we see that Camila has more perspective than everybody else in what's going on because she's been with this band for years, but also she is away from it. She's a step away. She's able to look in instead of be in it. In the book, that lack of bitterness shows a bit more that she does now understand more about addiction compared to the series being bitter and jaded. She has obviously had enough. She's decided she's been put through enough and she's calling it quits. But you lose some of that well-rounded perspective on Daisy and Billy that she originally has. I'm not saying getting rid of the book scene was all around a terrible choice because I think it was really powerful to have Daisy make that choice that she was going to go to rehab and have Simone with her and that amazing scene where Simone says you've left family before and Daisy turns around and says I just really loved this one I sobbed that's when I started crying in that final episode I think you see that more in the tv series how much of a family the band become 
that relationship of Daisy and the band, you see it develop more in the TV series. But I think they left some of the development of Camila out. They missed out Camila's ability to see the best in people whilst acknowledging their worst traits. In the book, she knew Billy would be loyal, even if it didn't always seem that way. When push came to shove, he would stay with her. She knew Daisy could have a beautiful life even if Daisy didn't yet know that herself. Camila was not naive, but she was hopeful and trusting and believed that everybody deserved a chance to be better. I think there's two ways you can read her in the show and one is that she's a woman that's been pushed to the edge. You know, she's finally choosing herself over Billy and she's making him fight for them instead of her having to fight to stay with him in the face of everything he's done. But you can also see it as some of her nuance has been lost. She doesn't acknowledge the way that although Billy and Daisy both had their faults, they both deserve the chance to be everything they could be because I'm not sure she sees so much anymore everything they could be. Instead, she reduces them to their worst capabilities the ones that hurt her. But instead of Camila being this interventionary force, Daisy's given the opportunity to love Billy enough to let him go and to love herself enough to know that he's not good for her. She's given the chance to save Billy whilst also saving herself. At the same time, she becomes ultimately selfish and selfless. She goes on stage, and again, we're gonna quote, I've been in love, and it hurts, doesn't it? But it doesn't have to. Love doesn't have to be bombs and tears and blood. Love can be peace, and it can be beautiful. And if you're lucky enough to find somebody who lifts you up, even when you don't deserve it, that's where the light is. That's in the final performance in episode 10. And she is so clearly talking to Billy, not the crowd. She is so clearly talking about Billy and Camilla. And she begins to sing Honeycomb as a love song, which is how Billy originally wrote it, as the love song to Camilla. And as she plays this, she turns around to him and tells him to go. And he leaves the stage and in that moment she lets him go and he goes to fight for his family, for his marriage, for the woman who helped him be healthy rather than the woman who is the personification of his addictions and his vices. There's this incredible understanding that's created between the two in that moment on stage in the way they mirror each other and the way we get to see them create these amazing lives because they let each other go because they focused on what was good for them but oddly i think some of those changes were the writers trying to make the audience like daisy which i don't think they need to do we've spent all this time learning her flaws learning her motivations learning why she does things she isn't a despicable character and it is when she turns round and says she's going to rehab that there is a redemption in any despicable acts that she has committed because that is at once her being selfish enough to put herself first, to put the energy she's always put into songwriting and being acknowledged and being heard she puts that into her own health and well-being and recovery and she is selfish enough to do that but at the same time she's selfless enough to let the man she loves go to save a marriage she didn't need to be a redeemed character on stage her leaving that would have been enough and whilst the show definitely did camila a disservice in the Chicago scenes, I will say that I loved, truly adored the fact that they took the letter at the end of the book that was to her daughters and made it a video clip that Julia shows both Daisy and Billy. Among other things, we see this amazing moment where Julia asks Daisy if she'd do it all again. 
And Daisy says, I don't know how your mother would feel about that. It shows suddenly that she's not just thinking about herself or Billy anymore. She's thinking about how her actions affect other people, which is growth enough. Anyway, it shows that finally she is in a better place. She has grown. She's done the work. And at the same time, we get told that Billy, he went back to rehab. He got into the program. He made amends with his daughter. He never missed a recital. They have both made amends. They have both healed and they are both in far better places in their life. And it's why having that included, when Daisy opens the door after Billy knocks, we can accept that maybe now they can be the best of what they were because they aren't a powder keg anymore. She isn't the ultimate temptation to his addiction and at times the object of his addiction. They're two people with so much history who owe an amazing woman a song. Acknowledging how these characters try to fight themselves but also how much they try to self-destruct because they don't believe themselves worthy. That's integral. Absolutely integral to the point of the show and the book. They aren't things you look at and go, I like these characters because they always do the right thing. Knowing these characters, it's coming to understand why they do the things they do and rooting for them to make the best choices for themselves so they can find their peace. It's not necessarily about who should end up with who, although that becomes a very big part of it. It's more about making the right choices for yourself as an individual, even if it doesn't look like the right choice to someone else. That's where we're going to go into talking about some of these amazing female relationships. Like I've said, they do this amazing example of representing the fulfilled woman. You have Camila, who is fulfilled with her family and her children. But then you have Karen who does not see that as fulfillment but is being trapped. She finds her fulfillment in being a touring musician and being credited for something that she has put so much work into in a man's world of music. You also have Daisy who doesn't know her way through life and doesn't know what will fulfill her but goes on a journey of figuring that out. And it gives these three different narratives of creating the fulfilled woman that are all okay, whether that be a traditional role within a family, whether that be career, whether that be figuring it out. Daisy manages to have both, you know? She has an amazing music career and a daughter by the end of it. It portrays that there is more than one option, but also the support all of them have for each other suggests that just because something is not the right choice for you does not mean you should not support another woman's choice to do what is right for her. There's also some amazing moments between Karen and Daisy. When Daisy is kicking Nikki out, go Daisy, she throws a bus at him and Nikki grabs her. The boys get in the way. Family. This is what I'm saying, they created a family without comment, without knowing what was going on. They protected Daisy and they hung back. They didn't get involved until that man put hands on her and they got in the way because they knew Daisy could take care of herself, but they weren't letting him touch her. Eddie goes to comfort Daisy and she shakes him off because this is the thing. She's been taught through her vulnerabilities in the past to not be vulnerable and around men. Karen comes up behind her and Daisy just melts into her. They don't say a word. It's that silent support. And then later in the final show, after... Karen's had her abortion after Graham's found out and there's so much tension between Karen and Graham. Whilst there's also so much going on with Daisy and Billy, Daisy is singing and comes and sits beside Karen at the piano. She sits next to her as a supportive force and unites as women in that situation where so much tension is on that stage, but they are there supporting each other. It is amazing because no words are exchanged in these situations. They just are there for each other. Alternatively, we do see Daisy as a very supportive friend in a fiery way when Simone, Simone tells her about a producer who Simone was recording with and asked her to sit on his lap. He kind of forced her to. 
and was rubbing his hand on her thigh. She got up and rejected him, essentially, and he goes and uses her recorded voice and gives the credit to someone else. And when Daisy finds this out, she's angry and she's willing to defend her friend. And I think that is amazing, but she's also there for supporting her friend, which is even more amazing still. All these women, these musicians, the music industry has abused them all in different ways. I mean, even to the point of Rod said that Karen should wear low cut tops. They all have been abused and objectified by the industry they're in and they all look out for each other within it as a result they all look out for fellow women because they've all been there in this man's world it's unspoken it's never explicitly said but it's amazing to see the connections they have and also while we're just talking about karen can we talk about how Graham said he was willing to sacrifice the life he wanted, you know, the wife, the kids, the white picket fence, to remain touring with Karen because he loves her if she just says she felt the same way. And she says nothing. In the interviews, he says, if it wasn't for her being brutally honest, meaning saying she didn't love him, him or not saying she loved him and then you cut to the interview of karen saying i told him what he needed to hear but i wasn't being honest with him oh it broke my heart but it's another amazing example of loving someone enough to let them go and to do what is best for them she wasn't sacrificing what she knew would fulfill her for Graham, but she was not going to let him do that for her either. Again, a masterclass in complex and nuanced characters and relationships. On top of this amazing show, you have the released album and music from the show on Spotify, which keeps people engaged with it. And do not be surprised if Daisy Jones and the Six is one of my top artists in my Spotify rap this year. Don't ask questions, just go with it. They also have like albums or playlists for each episode on Spotify so you can listen to the music that's in the show and just the vibe of it, which I think is great. They've done the clothing range with free people, which is very much the vibe anyway. And I've seen them send like as PR, they sent this amazing custom designed guitar case full with like the free people range inside and it's just amazing marketing even people who may not necessarily have previously known about the show that is an insane pull and i swear we're gonna have a 70s summer i can see it now at least i am on top of that even i know waterstones in the uk i don't know if they're still doing it but for a while some of them when you bought the adaptation tv show tying cover you got a tote bag that was a daisy jones tote bag and that had like different goodies inside even that i've seen people hunting literally around waterstones to find them and documenting that which creates amazing buzz around the show i'll insert the tie-in cover here but this is my uk cover and i don't like this cover i don't feel like this really daisy jones i don't love this cover i don't think the tie-in cover's bad i think they actually did a fairly decent job on the tie-in cover and honestly i was walking around uni all of march with like my headphones in and i was listening to regret me or let me down easy and i think the line every lies true at the time baby that's the thrill is being slept on i had Adore that line. I also think it gives amazing insight to who Daisy kind of is. Like her genius in the way that she has a really unreliable perception of herself. The general unreliableness of the narration. I mean the reveal that it's Julia, Billy's daughter. We still got that which made me very happy. And some would say like we can't have as many unreliable narrators because there's a linear story but you still have the fact that there's some unreliableness in the fact that they're talking to Julia, who they may have known as a child, or like Billy, this Billy's daughter, he obviously knows her, Miss Graham's niece, like all of those things. But you also have the unreliableness suggested by every life's true at the time, baby, that's the thrill. These people, their perception of themselves is skewed. And also they were on so many substances at the time. Who is to trust their memory? 
there is still an unreliable aspect to the narration and the way they work it in I think is really interesting and I just think that line ties into it quite well. That's kind of the bulk of my thoughts. I feel like I've been talking for a really long time so I am going to wrap it up. Personally, I really enjoyed the series adaptation. I thought it brought our characters to life well. I thought it kept them that complex and flawed and there's a lot of nuance to it. I think the story was worked well into a screen audience where you had to lose things, you had to condense things to make it fast-paced and engaging to a audience who don't know the story as well as who do, otherwise I think we would have got bogged down in details. Obviously no book adaptation is ever going to please everyone, it's also never going to include everything from the book. I think a lot of things I can excuse, how they changed Camilla is some of my biggest kind of pet peeves with it, but I understand why they did a lot of those changes and the effect they had works well in the storyline they created, but I think both fans of the book and completely new fans can enjoy the show and overall I'm really pleased with how the TV show was created, adapted and how faithful it feels to the source material. I want to end on the amazing dialogue that is largely lifted from the book that is created even better in the TV show because they have Daisy and Billy alternate saying sentences and it's right near the end but I think it truly showcases the parallels of these two characters and how much they acknowledged they needed to heal and how much they would not have been good for each other. So we start with Billy and then we alternate each sentence and it goes like this. Everything that made Daisy burn made me burn. Everything I loved about the world, he loved about the world. Everything I struggled with, she struggled with. It were two halves in the way you almost never find with anyone. But at the same time, we were a mess. Two natural disasters who needed to heal. And I don't think we would have done that. I mean, I know we wouldn't have, at least not then. But yeah, that's all I have to say. So thank you guys for watching. Again, like, comment, subscribe, click the notification bell. You know this. This is a bit of a, a turn in content for me, a bit of a new road. So let me know if you enjoyed it. Let me know if you'd want to see any more video essays on any other books, adaptations, deep dives into authors. Let me know what you thought of Daisy Jones and the Six, the adaptation, the book, where you agree or disagree with me. I would love to hear some other thoughts. Enjoy it all and I'll catch you guys in the next one. Bye.